Hey everybody, this edition of Lineheart Radio is brought to you by the world's first creatine coffee. Each scoop is a full cup of a Colombian Arabica bean coffee infused with five grams of a creatine monohydrate. Now here's the deal, guys. A lot of people have differing opinions about creatine, and unfortunately a lot of really shitty supplement companies have tried to sell it to kids that want to get big and they package it as some kind of steroid alternative and they tell you if you cycle it and if you stack it then you'll gain a bunch of muscle mass and at the end of the day none of that is true what is true is that it's one of the most studied and beneficial supplements on the market for strength recovery and endurance so whether you're a runner whether you are a strength athlete Uh, or whether you're somebody that wants to enhance cognitive function and just feel healthier in everyday life, a pharmaceutical-grade creatine monohydrate is going to help get you there. Go to www.creatinecoffee.com to learn what all the hype is about. And now, on to the show. Welcome back to Lionheart Radio. I'm your host, Rick Alexander, founder of Lou Aviv in San Diego, California. And today I am joined by Sarah Hendershot, who is a former Division I first team All American rower out of Princeton University, a two time world champion, and most importantly, well, most importantly to me, <laughs> won the 2012 U.S. Olympic trials, uh, punching her ticket to the 2012 London Summer Olympics. So, Sarah, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Rick. Yeah, thank you. So I think not very many people actually know an Olympian. Uh, I don't think, actually, I don't know anyone that does. Uh, and you're our first Olympian on the show. So I definitely want to get into that entire journey and, and that process. But to give people an idea of where the whole your whole athletic journey started, could we maybe go back way to the beginning to where you got into fitness and uh, being an athlete in the first place? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm more than happy to start at the started the very beginning. <laughs> um, so I just grew up in a competitive family and I was the first child of four, um, and have three younger siblings. And we just were a competitive household, uh, right from the beginning. Both of my parents played division one sports. Uh, they were athletic. They exposed me to sports from uh, as early as I can remember. Um, and I tried just about everything. So I tried swimming. I tried lacrosse, soccer, tennis. Um, you know, I did softball, a little bit of everything. And as I got older, I sort of started to gravitate towards those sports that I was performing a little bit better at. When I got to high school, I chose to play soccer in the fall season. Um, and then I was a swimmer in the winter. And when it came time for spring for me to kind of choose what sport I was going to play for that season with my high school, I didn't really have a specific one that I knew for sure that I wanted to do. So I was kind of deciding between track and field. Um, and maybe I was going to join the lacrosse team because a lot of my girlfriends were doing that, but somehow I kind of ended up wandering down to the rowing boat house. Uh, I was suggested to be my, by, by my parents that I go and give that a little bit of a try because I was tall. I already had this endur- endurance base from my swimming uh, background and from doing that from when I was about four years old. And they had heard that, you know, there was opportunity to gain scholarships to, go to college, um, in rowing through the division one title nine, um, you know, scholarship system. So I went down to the boathouse and tried it out. And it was pretty clear from the beginning that this was going to be a sport that no matter, um, you know, depending on how much energy and effort I wanted to put into it, that was going to dictate how much I got out of the sport and Mm. that, that I loved. Um, so found rowing at the age of 14 and, uh, just kind of took off from there. So that's interesting. So you went into rowing actually thinking like, this is my chance at a scholarship. Yeah, because I knew I wanted to play a sport in college. And for a long time, I thought that was going to be either soccer or swimming. And I probably could have gone to a division three school for soccer. Um, And my shoulder kind of became the limitation for me with swimming. I uh, developed an injury through just the years. And I think probably not perfect technique um, and a lot of volume training there with swimming. And so I found rowing as an option that, you know, that was another potential way that I could go to a division one school and play sport. Hmm. So I'm curious when you were swimming and playing soccer, so soccer is a, a bit of a longer time domain and definitely, you know, an endurance sport as far as like, uh, the, the physiology of it. And I'm curious where your swimming distance, were they endurance? And then how did that transfer to rowing? Cause I was looking at your time domains for rowing and it was like more like the seven minute time domain. Is that correct? Right. And so actually what what typically would end up happening was that I would finish up a soccer season and yes I'd be in 
in good shape, but it was a very different kind of shape. It was more of, you know, that, that, you know, continuous moving on the field for an extended period of time and then with sprinting bursts. But I would enter into the swimming season in less good endurance shape. And after an entire winter of working on swimming, which was just primarily aerobic and uh, hitting a lot more of those middle distances. And my races were typically with between the 100 and 200 meters of distance. That actually translated a lot better to the rowing fitness than my soccer uh, fitness did. And actually, that's a pretty common trend. There are a lot of overlap. There's a lot of overlap between swimmers and rowers and a lot of swimmers that turn into rowers when they get to that collegiate level. Yeah, and I uh, probably body type as well, right, with like the longer limbs and... That. Yep. And the, and the lean muscle mass, I think as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think there's actually a lot of research that's coming out. And I, I recently had Dr. Andy Galpin on the show and he talks a lot about how type they're finding out that type one, the muscle fibers, that slow twitch muscle fiber can actually be converted to type two in, in basically anybody, just depending on your adaptation and what you're doing for a sport. So that's pretty interesting too. Yeah. Rather than everybody saying, I'm just a fast twitch or a slow twitch athlete, it's actually about training those systems properly. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when did you realize uh, that you wanted to be an Olympian? And then the second part is like, when did you realize that you actually could be? So when did I realize I wanted to be that I, I can pinpoint back to about 10 years old? Um, I very specifically remember this project that we had to do for one of my classes where we had to choose somebody historical that we found significant and do a project on them. And I ended up choosing the swimmer Janet Evans. And she, she was a Olympic gold medalist back in the 1988 Olympics. And I just found her fascinating a little bit because she, she was really young that Olympic cycle. And she was considered to be one of the much smaller athletes that round. And although I wasn't small to, you know, to be fair, as far as the average height goes, I'm 5'11", um, 160. Uh, in the rowing world, I'm small <laughs> on the elite rowing world. Uh, most of the women that make the Olympic team are over six feet. So I, maybe something about that. I connected with this underdog, smaller person kind of story. Mm. And I just knew I wanted to go to the Olympics. And so I thought that that was going to be through swimming and kind of had that as something that I, I had my eyes set on. But it wasn't really until I got to college um, and I went to Princeton University that I realized that there was the potential for that to really happen. Uh, and part of the reason why that became, uh, you know, an eye-opening experience is because the national team shares boathouses with the uh, Princeton University college rowing team. We shared boathouses and we shared locker rooms. So I was rubbing shoulders with these Olympic rowers when I was a sophomore in college and the 2008 Olympics were coming up and they were preparing to go to Beijing. And I saw them on a day to day basis. And I think just being in that environment and realizing that these women, although total superstars, they were also humans and you could catch them at some of their best moments and some of their worst after a session in the locker room, just kind of sort of made me realize like, Oh, okay. These are the kind of scores that these women are pulling on the rowing machine. Uh, this is the kind of dedication that they have. I have similar dedication. I think I could do that. And then it, I just kind of slowly started to chip my way to the place where I, I would be looked at on the national team. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. So I think that, and I talked to uh, one of our episodes, Mike Bledsoe, we talked a little bit about this, but people have this idea of like what reality is for them. So if you've never associated with somebody that like, for example, is an Olympian, uh, then to you, that's just this crazy thing that you know, people aren't even capable of. It's like other people. It's not you. It's not people right. you know. And it's interesting how once you did associate with those people, it really just broke that paradigm altogether. And you were like, oh, no, shit. These are people just like I'm people. Like, we can do this. I can do exactly. this. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. That's really cool. So once you finished at Princeton and then that's when you went full time to the dream? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the traditional kind of uh, progress is that you try out at some point for either the junior national team or the under 23 national team. Um, and I was still on the, the figuring out the path during my junior years. So before I turned 18 and so I never made a, a junior national team, but I did actually make an under 23 national team right as I was graduating from college. So I, I applied to try to make that team graduated um, in 2010, joined up with their selection group for that summer, made the team, went to that U23 world championship and won a gold medal. And at that point there, I had a job offer on the table 
um, to go to Wall Street and to become an eye banker. And I kind oh, of damn. was just, yeah, I was sort of just following the path that a lot of my other schoolmates were doing. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I had interned um, at a bank the summer before and had gotten that full-time offer. And so I'm sitting there now with these two options, two drastically different life options. Do I go to Wall Street and you know, do I try to start my career and really put my head down and work my ass off and probably not see the sunlight for a few years? Um, or do I shelf that? And do I try to now pursue this Olympic dream? And I just kind of couldn't turn down the dream of trying to become an Olympian. So I pushed back that, um, offer from wall street. I actually deferred it. So I deferred it and kept it on the table thinking that maybe I was going to tr going to go back and try that at some point. I never ended up doing that, hmm. but yeah. So after that under 23 experience, I then joined the senior national team group, which was a whole different level and just started to train with their group. And it was about halfway through that Olympic cycle. So it was 2010. We had two more years to go until the 2012 Olympics. What, what was that pressure like? So depending on, you know, relationship with your parents and your friends and all this, what was the pressure like to take that job and do probably the quote unquote safe thing at the time? Uh, well, I think, you know, it was, it was tempting as far as the initial salary. It looked nice. The, the career route, it's pretty mapped out for you as to, you know, you spend a certain number of years here. This is what your pay raise is going to look like. But my parents were supportive and more than anything, my boyfriend at the time who then became my fiance and is now my husband, he was super supportive and really kind of pushed me to do that. And I, I think because I had a network of people that believed in me and thought that, you know, it's a, it's a two year go. Why not give it a shot? Um, you have the rest of your life to work. Uh, that made the decision pretty simple for me. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's actually a good takeaway for the listeners is like building that, that extremely like supportive network. Obviously you don't want people that are so supportive that when you're like way in the clouds, they're going to be like, Oh no, definitely go do that when it's a bad idea. But you also want somebody that's going to support you when you're trying to do something that, you know, essentially a very, very small percent of the population is you know, capable yeah. or going to do. Absolutely. And I mean, that's something that I learned throughout my my athletic career because I ended up training for two Olympic cycles. The, this is something that's been proven in psychology. And I was a psych major, the top five people that you surround yourself with greatly, greatly influence the person that you become and the characteristics that come to surface. So there were points throughout this journey where I was surrounding myself with five people that probably weren't the ones that needed to push me in the direction I needed to go. Mm -hmm. And as we went finding those right voices and the right influences and, and those, yeah, those supportive people that was really important in me seeing success. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you touched on something right there and I'm just curious, how, how were you a psych major going to work on Wall Street? Like, what was the connection there? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's kind of uh, the beauty of liberal arts. I just went, I loved psychology when I was in school and I um, kind of drifted towards that, H had taken a couple of econ classes, but that was it. And when I was interviewing for this position, just kind of sold myself as a really hard worker and a fast learner and that, it, you know, it didn't matter that I didn't have the background, I was going to learn it. And I think that that actually is pretty typical that um, a lot of people that are hired into positions like that are not necessarily finance or econ majors. They're, they're willing to learn on the job. You just have to have a couple characteristics to, to get you there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. 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 I was yeah. Curious. yeah. Um, uh, what was your training like leading up to the Olympic trials? Could you take us through like maybe what a typical week would look like? Yeah, sure. So leading up to the 2012 games, um, you know, I'm 22, 23 years old, still young, body's fresh, uh, and could handle a lot of volume. Um, so the program that the national team was following and that I was following at that time was a very high volume, high meters, uh, kind of approach to, um, rowing in general. And so we would get up every morning and meet usually right around six 30, we'd warm up as a group. And at seven o'clock, we'd be shoving off of the docks, um, in boats to go out for a row. Most of the national team training is done in small boats. So that's in either singles. So you're out there by yourself in a one person shell or in pairs or doubles. So those are two person boats, um, that you're, you know, just with one other person and those small boats really force you to create a lot of skill and to develop that skill because 
it's just you and one other person or it's just you. And so it's very clear as to why the boat is going fast or it's not. When you are in a four person boat or an eight person boat, it's a little bit easier to hide or it's mm. harder to figure out sometimes why something might not be going well. Um, so most of the training is done in small boats because it's a really great tool. And we would go out there for anywhere usually between 18 to 22 kilometers of rowing. Um, the majority of that program is slow, slow, long distance. So it would be, you know, at about 70 to 75% uh, speed off of our 2K speed. So it's pretty slow and easy. Most of it's drilling and just keeping that heart rate in a certain zone. Uh, then we'd come in, I'd, you know, stretch and mobilize for a little while, go home, eat breakfast. Sometimes we would have a weight session. So on the, on the days that we had triples, we would have about an hour to an hour and a half between that first row and um, weight training. And then we would go and meet at the gym, do that for usually about an hour our program would take. And then we would have off until about 2 p.m. in the afternoon, come back for another long row that was usually somewhere between 16 and 20 kilometers. So the amount of volume that we're accumulating throughout the week very typically was above 200 kilometers for that, for that week. Uh, we would be touching on speed during certain points as well. And, and depending on the point the, of the year and the goal that we were currently in for that training phase, some of that work was on the rowing machine as well. And so typically we were testing on the rowing machine once a week and that was being ranked and scored and, uh, going into part of the process of your selection as well. Gotcha. So how did you measure training volume? Was it just meters or were it like time domain or like time on the water? It sort of depended, but for the most part, the biggest number was just calculating the number of meters. Oh, okay. Even, yeah. and when you went into like, did you, I, I'm assuming you had to do like speed work and then volume and like you want to work on capacity and then you want to work on speed and then you also want to work on technique. I'm assuming they were all like kind of broken into different blocks, just like Yep. Else. Exactly. So we'd have training zones um, and uh, each session would be spe specifically in a different training zone. And some of that speed work fell into faster zones. Um, and the team has actually advanced quite a bit now, even from then, from 2011 or so. Everybody's issued heart rate monitors and GPSs and all of that um, information it goes to, into a big database that the coach looks at. So he can see what your speed on the water is, how that correlates to where your heart rate is, um, how many minutes you're spending in each zone, um, and and doing a lot of the work uh, that way as well. Mm. What did your weight training look like? So so the, the it, everything that I'm talking about in general is, is interesting because this was the first way that I did it. So this was leading up into London. Um, everything that I did leading up into the selection of Rio was completely different. So this program that the training center was following when I was with the national team was very much so of like a three by 10 kind of uh, an approach where you would do, you know, maybe a back squatting or a front squatting, um, one day of the week, maybe a little bit of deadlifting, um, a bunch of different movements, but n nothing too functional, to be honest. Like we did a lot of bench pull, um, some back extension work, things like that, but following like a three by 10 kind of approach, hmm. um, wh where my weights didn't increase that exponentially over a period of time. And honestly, it's because I like, like you can't really, when you're doing that much volume, the volume is so, uh, crushing <laughs> that you one are always worried about that next erg score or that next test on the water and trying to keep yourself as fresh as possible for that. So a lot of the team like won't push their numbers in the weight room that hard because they're trying to conserve themselves for like the pieces that are actually going to go towards selection. And the other part is you're just fried. Your, your legs are fried all the time. So it's more about, I always felt like it was just maintaining strength rather than really making these big pushes of in, improving my strength. Yeah. I'm surprised. I would think there would be a lot of posterior chain, but I guess when you're just spending that much time on the water, that's, you know, that's all you have time for. Well, in my opinion, to be honest, this is where there's a lot of room for rowing in general in the United States to advance. Um, we're a little bit behind. And I know that now because I've worked with national teams from New Zealand and people from Australia and Great Britain and have heard now what their teams are doing and their weight training program is very different than what the United States is. And when I was leading up to the Rio games, had a completely different approach on weight training and on my volume training and zones and all of that. And I think started to follow a program that looks a lot more like what's being done in other countries. And personally, I like the latter a lot better. Um, mm. And I saw bigger improvements in my health and my, my overall fitness. So I think there's room to improve there. But 
this approach still is winning medals for the United States, um, mostly in the women's eight. So there, there's been this very uh, long history of winning medals. We've won three Olympic gold medals in a row uh, in the women's eight at the United States. So, so something is working about this this high volume approach um, for that boat specifically. So uh, I'm a little bit naive. What's the women's eight? So the women's eight is there's eight eight women um, rowing together in a, in a shell. There's a ninth person in the boat as well. There's a coxswain that steers the boat and actually speaks into a microphone and com- like a, commands the race plan to those rowers. Mm-hmm. So it's eight people together um, rather than the boat that I competed in at the Olympics was the pair. So it was me and one other person. Oh, okay. And did you have to spend a ton of time with that one other person? Just I'm just curious, leading up to the trials? Actually, no, because that's not really the way that the training center is split up. The The way the training center is, is set up is that you will row for a period of time with one partner. And at the end of that period of time, usually there is some kind of a um, race or selection piece that will dictate how that you and that partner performed. And then you will switch to another partner. And it, it kind of depends um, on the year, the cycle, and the way that the coach is looking at things at that time period as to how long you spend with that partner. But I had not spent that much time with my, who ended up being my Olympic partner. I spent um, about two months with the, her leading up to the 2011 world championships. I spent another two months with her in the fall of 2011. And then we were not in a boat together again until six weeks before Olympic trials. And so what was really kind of special about that partnership was the fact that we had this instant chemistry from the first time we got in the boat that did not happen with all of my other partners. We just kind of clicked and our stroke profiles matched up really well, which is a very important part about the pair because there's only one rower on each side of the boat. In order for you to keep it straight and efficiently moving forward, your stroke profiles need to really match up well. Yeah, and I'm so sure. th- that naturally happened with this partner of mine. So we were lucky as far as that went. And we also just worked really, really well together as far as you know, being teammates and relying on one another in tough racing situations. So the fact that we hadn't spent a ton of time together, yeah, that didn't play to our advantage necessarily. Other countries follow very different models where you're with that same partner for years and years and years. But, you know, it's, it worked out because, because we did click so naturally. Yeah. Did you two uh, try to go for, was it you two again, going, leading up to Rio, trying to, trying to go again? It was, but only for the final year leading up to Rio. And that's because my partner retired and um, I worked with a bunch of different partners. And um, and then the way that that kind of path led was that I was either going to go back in into this big boat camp selection where I was going to be looked at for one of the four man boats or the eight, or I was going to have to convince my old partner to come out of retirement. And that's what ended up happening. It's like oh, convinced nice. her to come back. And then we ended up, yeah, rowing together for the last year leading into the Rio selection. So I'm curious because a lot of times we, we talk to these people on here that have these really cool stories. And it was like these really, these stories were like, they just went for what they wanted to do. But, and you know, a lot of times when you ask them like, what advice they have, they say, well, you just got to go for it. And usually real life has a lot of obstacles in the way when you just go for it. And I'm curious, one of those obstacles is always money. How did you live? How did you live when you were like, after college, you were like, oh, I'm going to go for this full time. Um, Cause you're spending so yeah. much time on the water training. Yeah. It, and that was absolutely an obstacle and it still is an obstacle for the uh, U S rowing national team uh, because it's not a heavily funded USOC sport. Uh, really the, the biggest, the leaders for the funding that the USOC gives out, I believe, um, is track and field swimming and gymnastics as far as the summer Olympic, um, uh, sports go. And so there is a small amount of stipend that us rowing is given to divide among its, um, uh, many rowers that are there training. And typically the women's national team carries about 30 or so women training at once and only 14 of them end up making the Olympic team. So there's not enough money to go around for everyone. Uh, we ended up living with host families. That's what the majority of the women did. So you live with a family that um, lives in Princeton. You are given a room by them, uh, by their hospitality. Sometimes you have a family that actually cooks you some meals in exchange for whether it's like childcare or, you know, they just want to find a way to help support an Olympian. Um, but we all also had part-time jobs just to try to scrape by enough cash to, to live. Um, and so 
We had people on the team that were dog sitters. We had people on the team that, you know, worked at local sandwich shops. It was really kind of whatever you could find that was willing to be flexible around our training schedule. Um, just to, to put a couple of extra dollars in our pockets. It, you just did everything you could to save money and to kind of figure out how to make it work. Damn. Yeah. So it really just is everyone just doing what they can to, to be there and to, to go for it. Yeah, exactly. What was your biggest hurdle uh, to get to the Olympics? I would say my biggest hurdle was was um, just trying to find an advantage over these women that were bigger, taller, stronger than me and had better scores on the rowing machine. So a lot of the selection that's done on the national team is done based on your score on the rowing machine. And that's really like your foot in the door. If you don't have that number, you're not really being looked at. And so I was teetering, you know, leading up to 2012, being towards the lower half of the group that we were training with as far as my numbers on, on the rowing machine. And there's, they were still very strong and very solid when you look at them comparatively to, you know, collegiate level and any, just in general, they're strong numbers, but on this elite level, they, they weren't as strong as the very top. Um, and you know, having more size definitely helps that number. So my, biggest hurdle was how do I make up for that? How do I make up for the fact that one, maybe I'm not being looked at by the coaches quite as much because that number isn't there, but two, how do I make up for that lack of size, strength, and fitness when we're out on the water? And what I ended up having to do and what I prided my, myself on was one, I, I convinced myself that I was going to be tougher than everybody else out there. So you, you might have more brawn, but you were not going to out tough me. I was going to suffer harder than you were late in the race, um, and kind of do it with no fear. And then the other part was just developing my skill. So you can make up for speed with a higher skill set, with more efficiency, um, applying that power onto the blade more efficiently. And so somebody that might be fitter than you isn't doing that quite as well. And I can make up for some of that um, just by really, really developing my boat feel and that connection with my partner. And so I think that was what ended up helping me to make the team and what ultimately ended up helping us win that Olympic trials race. Mm, that's similar to Olympic lifting. Like you can make just huge gains by not actually getting stronger, but by dialing in technique. Yep, absolutely. So, but I ended up realizing that there, there was a lot to be uh, gained there. And once I started to figure out what a lot of those boat cues were and how to pay attention to the way that the boat was moving, um, in relation to what I was doing with my body and, and my blade, uh, yeah, that, that became a puzzle that I loved unlocking. Because you were smaller, did you have to, uh, I don't know if it's called cadence, but did you have to row at a higher cadence? Yes. And I loved rowing at a higher cadence um, because yeah, that, that was something as, as well that can be scary um, mentally to think about taking that many extra strokes per minute as you're going down a 2k course. A lot of people have the mindset that that will burn your high octane strokes and that it's just m more sustainable to row at a slightly slower stroke rate. But I, I kind of found where that sweet spot was for me and uh, my partner and I realized that by using that stroke rate and that cadence, we were going to be able to outstroke and, and get in more work, uh, over the course of a 2k. And so, yes, for our, for our trials race in particular, also we outstroked. That's how the, one of the ways that you, we, uh, we call that when you have a higher stroke rate, we outstroked the, the boat that we were competing against. Okay. Well, that definitely <laughs> plays into your ability to suffer then for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was a painful race for sure. <laughs> um, what was your, what was your diet like leading up to the Olympics? Did they control that? Did the, uh, Olympic U S Olympic committee control that or no, uh, not at all. The, again, in, in the last, uh, eight or so years, there's been a lot of improvements, um, on the national team of how they look at that. And now, the team works a lot more closely with um, a nutritionist from the USOC just in order to help get, basically give guidance to each of the rowers of, um, you know, meeting the goals that they may need to, to meet, whether that's putting on a little bit of weight or shedding some. Um, but leading up to London, there was, there was no guidance. It was just kind of figure out what works best for you. And so looking back at that, um, my nutrition was drastically different leading up to 2012 than it was leading up to 2016. And it was actually pretty crappy when I, when I look at all that now, more than anything, it was about me getting my calories in. And I think because I was younger as well, I, w I was able to get away with that a little bit, yeah. but, but something now I realized was I was bonking quite a bit in the middle of these long 
20K rows out there. And I was sucking down like goo sugar uh, packets in order to kind of like get by uh, because I couldn't keep my energy high during these long sessions. So there was no real, you know, diet that I was following. It was about getting in enough calories to try to survive that, that training load. So have you counteracted that now by adding more fat into your diet? I'm just curious. Yeah. So I actually ended up playing with sort of like an athletic paleo diet, um, in 2014. Um, after I was dealing with a ton of injury, I, I approached my diet that way to try to reduce inflammation more than anything else. Yeah. And then I got hooked on how much more energy I had with a lower carb, higher fat sort of diet and without any grains as a part of my diet, that, that made a big difference too. I could tell that I was recovering from sessions better. Um, so that change, I, I wish that I had had it leading into the 2012 Olympics because who knows how that would have improved my performance. But, um, yeah, I mean, at this point that that's, that's kind of the, the eating habits that I follow now and something that I really liked in my second cycle. And you finished fourth in 2012. I finished fourth by about a foot. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, close. Did you did you replay that in your head at all? Oh yeah, yeah, for years, for years I did, and now I don't as much. It doesn't really haunt me anymore. Um, but yeah, those first few years after, it was just I was constantly thinking like, you know, what could we have changed? What did I do wrong there? Like so, so close. Um, but it was watching that race when I got home from London, seeing how close it was that kind of sucked me in for another go. Oh God. Yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So right before this episode airs, we are airing an episode with Zach Bitter who has the world, uh, American record for the 100 mile distance. Um, this is, oh, cool. yeah, he ran a seven minute mile for a hundred miles. Fucking oh amazing. my God. <laughs> but the reason I bring that up is because he, uh, actually cited bringing in fats and less grains for the exact same reason, which was to control inflammation for recovery. So yeah, it, it was huge. Definitely onto something there. Uh, just for perspective, what is your, what's your 500 meter time on the, on the rower on the concept? Uh, too? Okay. So, I mean, this hasn't been tested in a while, but my best ever that I did was right around a 123, um, okay. for 500 meters. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, it, depending on, you know, what kind of part of the, the training cycle you're in, that's going to shift as well, because when you're doing a lot more power specific work, that number is going to be better, but you don't want that number to be too good, or it's going to actually make your 2000 meters, uh, suffer a little bit. And, and really what the distance that we're training for, yes, is 2000 meters, but you're training for repeatable 2000 meters over the course of a week, because that's how the world championships is set up. That's how the Olympics is set up. You have to be able to recover and then go full bore at that 2000 uh, meter distance again, just a, a day or a couple of days later. Mm, interesting. So it really is actually an endurance event. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. So I looked at that seven minute time domain and I'm like, yeah, that's not really endurance. <laughs> But. Yeah, it is when you when you look at the body of work that you have to do over a championship weekend. Um, and I mean, it's interesting because I've looked at how this compares to track and field events and even, the, the, you know, those middle distance events that maybe are closer to seven minutes. And they have to go through um, heats sometimes as well before getting to the final. But uh, the approach in general, I think, in track and field is a little different. Everybody sort of conserves um, for the most part as they're advancing, and that doesn't always happen in rowing. You don't know really what you're going to get, and the conditions play a really big part of that as well. So what what kind of uh, water conditions are there? What kind of wind conditions are there? And if you, you can't predict that, that can make the race a totally different ball game. So when you have a big headwind, you can add a minute onto the time that that race is going to take, and it feels completely different. So you kind of have to be ready for for anything. Yeah, a minute all out too because, yeah, yeah, don't get me wrong, because an eight, seven, eight, nine-minute time domain, at least in my – the only thing I can uh, compare it to is CrossFit, but like when you have an eight-minute AMRAP, it's short enough that you absolutely have to go full bore and long enough that it just fucking hurts. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> sure okay, so my final uh, question about the Olympics, the Olympic Village afterward. Can you tell us about that? Or is it a, like a Vegas oh, yeah. thing where you can't? Okay, perfect. No, you can you can talk about it. <laughs> the Village was pretty awesome. Um, so the way that things were set up for us actually is that – in London, the rowing course was about 45 minutes or so outside of the city. So in order to 
um, make this convenient for everybody that was competing on that course. They had us in a rowing village specifically while we were competing. So we were not in the main Olympic village for racing time, but when that was done, we moved out of the rowing village and into the main Olympic village. So right after we're finished with all of our performance, we get to be surrounded with all these other cool athletes. And it felt like being on a college campus of all really athletic, beautiful people. And like the cafeteria was just the coolest thing ever because you're running into all these big time athletes and, uh, you know, people that have either just won gold medals or are about to go try to attempt to win them. And so, you know, there's a mix between people celebrating and also trying to be respectful of the fact that not everybody is done competing yet. Uh, we, we shared sweets with our other teammates. So, you know, there was varying experiences among this group <laughs> as I was in, in a relationship at the time and others were single. So we had, um, you know, different, different experiences over the course of that week. And it was fun to kind of see different perspectives of how people unleashed after competition was done. But as far as the partying scene went, like that was really fun because we hadn't been doing any of that for years leading up to it. Um, you know, like no alcohol, like no late nights. Like we're, I was in bed at eight or eight 30 every night for years leading up to that. So I essentially had this massive fear of missing out and like, didn't want to miss anything. So I didn't sleep for like four days straight, like went to every, um, event that I could go watch to support my own team USA teammates, and then went to every party that there was. So like Oakley hosted this big party. I went to that one. Budweiser hosted a big one. Um, Speedo hosted a big one. Just tried to kind of go to everything, meet as many people as I could, but yeah, it, it does live up to a lot of the the stories and the stereotypes that you hear. <laughs> That's awesome. Did it uh, escalate? And I don't know if you stayed, but did it escalate after the closing ceremonies? I left right after the closing ceremonies. And I think at that point, pretty much everyone's burnt out. So I ended up going on a short little vacation after that. And I think that's, that's pretty typical. People either go and just like veg out on a beach or they go home and completely decompress because after, after a whole, you know, week of competing and then a week of partying, you're, you're like kind of ready to come down off that high. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Done. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. So, uh, moving into row efficient, that's what you're doing right now. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So, um, we didn't talk too much about, um, that my second cycle leading into Rio, but in that second cycle, we, I realized quite a few different things, um, you know, as a maturing athlete and part of that journey was me trying to stay injury free and figuring out how to maximize my own potential. And what I learned through that experience is that weight training actually had a big part to do with me staying healthy and that, you know, there, there isn't necessarily like a one size fits all training plan that will get the best version out of everyone. And so kind of a changing and tweaking some of the ways that I was training, um, actually gave me a way bigger benefit. So I'm trying to take some of these lessons that I learned, um, and share them with the next generation of rowers. And that's really what we're doing with Rowficient. We're providing training plans. We're providing education. We're doing seminars at both boat houses. And now we're starting to do the, these at CrossFits as well, because rowing is an important part of CrossFit and, all these CrossFitters are hungry for knowledge on how to improve both their capacity and their rowing stroke. Um, so it's been really kind of a fun journey that is still, you know, taking shape and deciding what direction it wants to go in, but taking a lot of these lessons that I've learned and the knowledge just that I have of rowing in general and trying to pass it on to the, to the next generation of athletes. And how are you packaging that knowledge? Is it seminars or is it coaching? So it's online training plans right now. Um, uh, specifically designed for rowers and then some that are specifically designed for CrossFit athletes and then seminars as well. Yes. So, um, seminars that are out of, out of different gyms and out of boathouses. So for CrossFitters, cause I think, you know, our audience does tend to be a lot of CrossFitters. And I think, I think mainly they're just a good audience for anybody in the fitness community because they, they tend to be really open and they are hungry for knowledge, like you said, and there's so many different disciplines involved that they uh, have to be in order to be, yeah. be pretty good. Absolutely. So out of what you've seen, and you do CrossFit, right? I think you have seen that. I do. I just finished my first Open, um, but I was using a very like close to CrossFit style strength training program um, for the two years leading up to Rio as well. So yeah, I'm familiar now. When you say close to CrossFit, do you mean like a lot of the metabolic conditioning type work or, or what do you mean by that? Yeah, so um, I, we did just a lot of traditional strength training, not necessarily Olympic lifting, but more like, uh, squatting and deadlifting and overhead work. 
as part of our strength work, but then we really got into using those metabolic pieces as well to complement what I was doing on the water and realizing that actually I could push my, push my physiology there because it was a movement that wasn't the rowing stroke and something that I wasn't totally familiar with. So not only do you approach it with a fresh mental perspective, but then your body is also ready to do a movement that isn't just that same monostructural movement as well. So yeah, it was a combination of, of both pieces. So you're using different modalities to push yourself in that same time domain and you're finding adaptation to rowing by doing that? Yeah. And what I, what I found that really helped me with was figuring out how to, uh, really judge my perceived effort at different points of the rowing race. So we would do pieces that were, you know, somewhere between, you know, six and eight minutes. And I was constantly checking in mentally with myself. Is this what I should be feeling like a quarter of the way into a race? Is this how I should feel halfway through the race? And it could actually play back and forth to each other. So I was able to use that when I got back in the boat, realizing like, actually, no, I'm able to go way harder at the halfway point than I realized because I did that in the gym this week. And then being able to come back to the gym and do the same sort of thing, realizing like, nope, you have to pace yourself here because you know, you still have three quarters of this, of this piece to go. Um, and so, yeah, I actually found that that made a big difference in my athletic development and my physiology. That's real awesome because that's applicable to anybody listening, no matter what your sport is, right? Yeah, that's yeah. That's really cool. And it's nice when I'm um, after so many years of being used to seeing a number on the rowing machine that can get a little bit mental, like breaking over these barriers of, you know, trying to break, you know, uh, one, seeing that 140 per 500 meter split for an entire 2K, that, that gets a little mental. And when you don't have something that you're so familiar with in the gym, you, you don't have anything to compare it to. So you better just go hard. Uh, and I think that that helped me to learn, like I actually had more to give than I realized. Yeah, Absolutely. I'm just curious, do you, uh, do you find that you have to stay away from movements with a high neurological demand because of risk versus reward? What I mean by that is like, if you were to do a snatch, like obviously there's a higher risk of you doing snatch, especially for time. Do you stay away from movements like that? It just because you are, it's not your primary sport. Uh, yes. So when I was training and now with our own rowers, we don't really have them do things like that. Um, because, there's only so many sessions that they're going to spend in the gym and there's a big learning curve as far as the skill involved that it's, uh, we've kind of deemed it not worth it. Um, and so there's a bigger application of really properly learning how to do the deadlift or understanding how to squat well, that translates very directly to rowing. Um, whereas now that I'm just playing around and dabbling in CrossFit, yeah, I've started to pick up a lot more of, of these Olympic movements or things like handstand pushups and rope climbs that we never included in my training when I was rowing, because those were just skills that weren't quite as important for me to achieve while I was trying to be a rower. Um, and, and that's something that's important right now through row fishing, like for the rowers specifically that we're coaching, we're not trying to make them great CrossFitters. We're trying to make them great rowers. Um, and so that is an important part of the programming that we do for our CrossFit athletes. We're not trying to make you great rowers. We're trying to make you good CrossFitters. So you don't have to be an Olympic caliber rower. You just have to understand your own physiology and the skill of the rowing stroke well enough to be able to adapt it into a wad. So there is definitely a different approach for what kind of athlete you're trying to be. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad, I'm glad we're kind of thinking the same thing because I train a lot of the, uh, tactical athlete population and I take the exact same approach. Like if. If it's not what you're training for, you got to really look at that risk versus reward. Right. Now that you you have done some time and worked with CrossFitters, as, as far as what you've seen in your experience, uh, taking the knowledge that you have from the rowing background, what is the low-hanging fruit for CrossFitters to improve on their row? Quite quite a few things. Um, the first thing I would say is is stroke rate work. So this is something that's very overlooked in the CrossFit world that people are not quite familiar with and don't understand the importance of, but this is something that we're trying, we're trying to expose a little bit more of understanding actually the importance of training at different stroke rates because of, of how that will translate itself when you go to a performance type wad piece. Um, and what I mean by that is usually somebody will just hop on the rowing machine and 
just go and see what happens kind of, and go off of what feels right. Or, okay, I'm, you know, I have to go 50 calories. That's going to take me somewhere between three and five minutes. I'm just going to go and, and like, hang on. Um, rather than understanding if I improve my skill and my power application at 24 strokes per minute, when I try to go hard for somewhere between three and five minutes, I'm now going to be able to apply this skill at 30 strokes per minute or above. And that's going to get me through those 50 calories a lot faster. Um, and so I, I think that's, that's one for sure. Understanding the concept of stroke rate. Uh, another big one is just set up on the rowing machine, understanding where your drag factor should be set, understanding where your feet need to be set and actually getting into the position that works best for your dimensions to properly apply power throughout the rowing stroke. So those are a couple of things that we, we, we work on right off the bat whenever we start with uh, a new CrossFit athlete. Yeah, I'll double down on that because I crossfitted for uh, two or three hard years, and I definitely train with uh, a lot of CrossFit Games athletes, and I've never heard the word stroke rate in my life. Yep, and so this has been something that's been pretty fun that we're we're working with a few um, athletes that are getting ready to go to regionals that will probably go to the games, and that's been something that we've been hammering in since the fall, like understanding different speeds that you should be able to apply at different stroke rates. And then, you know, based on what movement you just finished, let's like, whether you're coming off of a gymnastics type movement or you're coming off of a heavy weight, that's going to change what kind of stroke rate you should be approaching the rowing machine at and how efficiently you're going to apply power. So having that in your back pocket as another knowledge piece, but also a skill makes a big difference when you get into a performance situation. Yeah, for sure. And if it's something you're, you know, intimately familiar with, it's definitely something that you can at least quickly flip through when you jump on the rower and, and you just to pace yourself, right. Um, d depending on what you're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. So even for an example for 17, four this year, depending on what kind of athlete you are, when you're coming off of all of those deadlifts and wall balls, like when your legs are fried, you should not be rowing at a long, low, hard stroke rate to try to get those 55 calories in because your legs are already gone. You should be trying to spin the erg, spin the fan and just get that turnover rate going. Try now to, to basically, um, uh, attack whatever system isn't already being, crushed by the previous movements and, and use your aerobic system. Uh, so, you know, kind of depending on what kind of athlete you are, we, we give prescriptions as to how to approach the, the rowing machine in different ways. Damn. So that makes sense as you're telling it to me, but I think my understanding has always been, you know, if you're rowing calories, it's long, hard pulls. I know, which is an interesting little thing that uh, is big debate in the CrossFit world. And we've tested this across a bunch of different ways. Um, it definitely depends on what your strengths are as an athlete. You know, if you're a power athlete and you don't have this capacity to just have this terrible lung burn and, and suffer through that, then yes, you're going to want to keep your heart rate down. And you're, you can do that through a lower stroke rate and harder pulls. But at the end of the day, the most efficient way to get through calories is always to take more strokes. Because if you are properly applying power um, and you're taking more strokes in a minute, you are going to eat up those calories faster. Even if you are getting one calorie per stroke and you're rowing really hard and low and long, if you're effectively applying that same sort of power output at a higher stroke rate, you will get through them faster. So it, it's about training those zones properly and then kind of figuring out all right, how, how, what's going to suffer if I do row at a higher stroke rate versus a lower stroke rate within this, the current wad that I'm doing. So yeah, it, it's very workout specific as well. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Not, I think the basic idea is just not applying that general rule to every workout, right? Cause okay. that's what yeah. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that definitely makes sense. And I should probably know this next question just from a physics standpoint, but I don't. You mentioned on height being uh, a very important factor of rowing, which I think a lot of people know. Uh, I've also heard that weight is uh, extremely beneficial, like just having mass. Yes, on the rowing machine, it it, it is uh, because if you again, if you are efficiently using that body weight, you have more to lay on the handle to spin that fan faster. Um, so some coaches use um, like weight. Uh, uh, essentially like weight scales to be able to figure out uh, what does your ERG score mean um, based on your weight to strength ratio. Um, and so we would, it would be put through, you know, uh, an equation in order to put everybody on the same playing field. Um, some coaches don't do that. When you get on the water, uh, you have to be able to move that body weight, right? So at some point you do hit a critical mass where it's no longer helpful to be heavy. Mm -hmm. 
But on the rowing machine, yeah, the bigger, the better, really. I mean, if you've seen some of these like big world records that have been broken or even like 100 meter records, they're big, giant humans <laughs> that have done that, um, that know how to effectively apply their body weight to the handle. Um, so weight helps, but you have to know how to use it. Yeah. So those same people would just essentially hit a diminishing return once they got on the water with that weight. Yes. Yeah, because you're gonna it, you're gonna slow yourself down if you're not able to apply that weight properly onto the handle. So there are plenty of really successful on the water rowers that are small that have figured out how to use every single one of their pounds um, efficiently, and then there are also very large heavy rowers that have done very well as well. It, a little bit that um, seems to depend on your boat class as well. So we find that a lot of big people end up being in the eight because there's a little bit less skill involved. So you can just pound that power onto the handle and get away with a little bit less efficiency in a boat that has more people in it. So I think for the majority of people listening to this, they will apply what they're hearing today to, to a concept too, because I think that's probably where a lot of people's training will go. Yep. Uh, as far as technique goes, can you speak to uh, the yeah, I don't know how to say this. The way that the chain moves when you row, should the chain, I've, I was originally told the chain should stay in a tiny little box. And then I've also been told that it's okay to drop the handle as you recoil. Does that make sense? Yes. It is most efficient to keep it within a tiny little box. And so we actually even will do this as a drill for rowers where we put tape above and below the chain and, or like athletic tape, and you're not allowed to to go outside of that zone. Um, and that's, that's more than anything about just efficiency of body position. So when you are on the recovery, when you're not actually applying power behind the handle, you are trying to set your body up into the proper position to effectively apply power for that next stroke. So if you're not getting those hands out first at the, at the proper level, and you're not then pivoting over from your hips and you're doing this in a, in a, in a funky kind of order, you're not activating the proper muscles to now create as much power as possible. It's the same concept as barbell cycling, really. If you have a really messy, um, you know, recovery uh, as the, as you're not creating power on the barbell, you're not going to be setting yourself up to have as pretty of a rep on the next one. So it's the, it's the same exact concept. And when you can ingrain those really efficient movement patterns on the rowing machine, you end up just saving yourself a ton of energy and therefore you can go harder for longer. Do you have resources or do you uh, actually provide resources yourself about helping people with the economy of motion on a rower like that? So we put a lot of free information out on our Instagram um, just to try to help in educate uh, both CrossFit and rowing athletes in general. Um, our specific programs that we sell online, yes, do come with video content uh, that suggest drills that will help your efficiency and your body position and understanding really like what you're trying to achieve as far as the rowing stroke goes. What is that Instagram where people can go check that out? It's at Rowficient. So Rowficient, uh, we realized after we launched, it's not the easiest thing to spell, <laughs> but it's R-O-W-F-F-I-C-I-E-N-T. And we're just at that handle at oh, Instagram. Yeah. I fucked that yep. up on my notes already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you watch the, I think it was a half marathon row in 2013 in the CrossFit game. Did you watch it and have you done it? I did watch it. Um, yes, I have done a half marathon before. Um, I've spent... I spent over an hour on the ERG just, you know, going for training pieces before. Um, and I didn't watch that live because I wasn't really super into the CrossFit world then, but I've gone back and watched it. And I would be very interested to see if something like that's going to pop up again. But it was also kind of fun to see the approach of different people and how they did it and how we would maybe suggest to do it differently. Because that that workout was the one where we had you had a 2K directly into the half marathon, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, so it yeah. was a half marathon, but their first score, like the first workout score technically was the 2K time. Yeah. So um, I've never done that. No, that sounds absolutely brutal to tax both of those systems like that and yeah. to have to flush out that 2K burn and then be on the machine forever. But yeah, I can just, I, I can definitely sympathize for the butt sores that I'm sure everybody was suffering through for that one. Yeah. And I think for all the ridiculous programming that happens in the CrossFit games, that's actually genius. Like if you're testing all around fitness, I think. Yeah. And I'm just going to go ahead and put this one out here now uh, with the games moving to Madison and the water that is very close to the venue that, uh, is going to, the games are going to be held at. 
I'm calling some kind of a rowing event actually at this games. And who knows if I'll be right, but there's been some little clues alluded to over Castro's social media. I could see there being some kind of a like, team potentially for the team event team rowboat event because the water there is much more conducive to rowing than open water ocean rowing and there are several teams that row on this body of water competitively i could see that happening so we'll we'll see what pops up this year <laughs> yeah that's actually a really good point so if you're listening to this and you are uh, thinking you're going to get there then you need to go see sarah for sure yeah, we're bringing our CrossFit team that we're sending to regionals. We're bringing them out on the water at the, uh, in the Charles out of Boston in the next couple of months uh, just to, to check all of our boxes and make sure that we have everything covered. <laughs> That'll be huge. I mean, it, every time, I think every single time the CrossFit Games uh, introduce something new, it is it is just a shit show out there. <laughs> so I don't yep. think, I think, yeah, that's true if, if you're, you know, literally every time, like, throwing a softball, climbing a pegboard, whatever it is, if they introduce it for the first time, you know, and then every, that next year, everybody works it and then they get really good at it. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. You might want to get ahead of the power curve on that one. We'll see. <laughs> um, so for 2020, what's next? Uh, another, another run at the Olympics? No, I am happily retired at this point. Um, enjoying not full-time training anymore. Um, I'm actually in the phase now where I'm trying to just kind of let my desires bring me to whatever, uh, next training venture or co competition, uh, that comes. So I just finished my first, uh, CrossFit open had never really completed all of them officially. I thought that was a blast and I definitely will continue to train, um, within CrossFit in, in some capacity here and there. I think what my next upcoming venture is going to be, and I'm still looking for some events to put on my calendar. Um, but I want to try to enter my first, Olympic weightlifting competition. And then within a week or two also enter into some kind of an endurance event. So whether that's like a half marathon trail run or an Olympic distance triathlon, uh, and kind of try to train these two systems at the same time and, um, do that in a fun way, because I, I know that that is possible. And I've done that with some of my rowing training as well, training both of these systems and having both of them improve, uh, and just kind of looking for something new and different. Mm. So Alex Viata, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but uh, you might want to check out some of the things that he does. He has like a – and I'm actually trying to get him on the show. But he he is a ultra marathoner who also has like a 700-pound squat. Wow. Yes. Yeah. I got to look him up. <laughs> and then we also have Brian McKenzie coming on who also – he does a lot of – a lot of he started CrossFit Endurance. He does a lot of work in uh, both of those time domains. So definitely – because that's yeah, our, those are actually my goals right now. So Brian was my coach for a year um, of the Rio cycle. Um, I moved out to California to work with him, and that's kind of how I started to follow that CrossFit style of training um, in my rowing approach. So I know Brian well. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Awesome. So the Lionheart Kicker is the final question that we always ask, and uh, that is if you could give advice, you could give blanket advice, and it was guaranteed that everybody in the world would hear it, it would be translated to every language, and maybe not everybody would follow it, but they would definitely uh, hear the advice that you gave them. What would you tell them? Well, so maybe just to stay in the theme of the Olympic pursuit and what that journey looks like um, as a piece of advice, I've seen a lot of other athletes that, you know, think that that's going to be their dream as well. And it's something that they want to pursue. And I just think it's important to know that in anything, when you want to be the best at something, when you want to really, really be the top of whatever that category is, you have to fully commit yourself to that thing and that thing only. And that becomes your only focus and the only thing that matters. Um, and really, I don't believe you can be the best at anything unless you have that one sole individual focus. You can be really great at a couple of things, but I don't think you can be the best. And just kind of understanding that that's the level of commitment that it takes in order to reach the top. I, I guess I would just give that kind of like mental advice of being willing to to sacrifice enough to, to put everything into that one basket, uh, because that, that's really what it takes. And I think in order to, to achieve that kind of level, I like that. And that's like very real advice because I think we're in a world that really preaches balance and there's something to be said for that, obviously, when you're trying to build a lifestyle, but when it, when it comes to being great at something, I really like that. That's not what you said. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, if you're trying to, to specialize in whatever category that is, even if you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to, you know, have the best startup business, that's got to be your sole focus. And I think you will find a lot of CEOs that say that that's how, how they live. Um, it's not a balanced lifestyle and you know, maybe it's not the most glamorous thing, but it does, I think it can lead to results.
Yeah, hundred percent agree. So, for people that are listening to this, how can people uh, support what you're doing? Find your programming and and follow along with your journey. Yeah, you can find us just at rowfishing.com or on social media. All social media we're at, at rowfishing. Um, so yeah, you can give us a follow if you're trying to improve your rowing. Awesome. For everybody listening, we will link that up in the show notes. You can go to lionheartrad.io, click on that, and you can find Sarah. Sarah, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. I hope that the information from today's show will make you fitter, happier, and healthier. For the show notes of this episode and every episode, head to www.lionheartrad.io. Yep, just like Lionheart Radio. And please, if you have the time, head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. It really helps us to know that we're on the right track in delivering you reliable information and value. As always, feedback is welcome. If you have any comments on the show or like to suggest a guest, send me an email at rick at louisvive.com. That's L-U-A-V-I-V-E. Dot com. Thanks for your support, yeah. and we will see you next time. <laughs> Bitch, I feel good. Don't I look stupendous? My shine is so endless, and shit you can do to end this. Even when I'm dead, niggas still gon' bump that chip shit. Coke, white, escalate on cinches for you dipshit. So you won't forget this. Midwest, nigga, be the coldest. Cleveland,